there like a very very short um, um, PowerPoint, a very uh, just um, some things about Helmut Plessner. Uh, so can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Um, and now we're here again. Uh, it should be okay now, right? You should see the main main slide. Uh, we see the whole so, okay. uh, app for now. Okay, that's good. Um, so Helmut Plessner, um, I don't know how many of you actually um, I mean, you've, you've probably you've probably all heard of him, otherwise you wouldn't be here, but I don't know how, how much you know about him. Um, and as you will see, um, knowing a little bit about his background, um, the milieu in which he kind of um, was formed as a scholar and a thinker is very important. Um, one of the things that um, one immediately notices when one starts reading Plessner is the explicit um, and implicit references to many other authors uh, that were either uh, contemporaneous with him or that were uh, important in the German, particularly German um, intellectual tradition. So um, having at least um, uh, an, uh, a vague knowledge about, uh, at least some knowledge about his life is uh, definitely useful. So uh, he was born in 1892, so basically towards the end of the 19th century uh, in Wiesbaden. His um, uh, father was a physician. Um, they seem to be a pretty well-off um, um, family. Um, he studied, he started uh, studying at 1912. Um, he was studying zoology and philosophy at the universities of Heidelberg, Berlin, and Göttingen, and was already then in touch with um, a lot of um, different currents that were present both in philosophy and science at that point. As you know, during this time, um, the, the, the German speaking uh, um, countries were uh, basically uh, brimming with uh, interesting novel ideas and uh, a lot of very exciting stuff was happening both in the um, philosophical and the scientific um, domain. So um, I took this short biography from the um, Plessner Gesellschaft, so you can find it there. <laughs> uh, and there they say that Plessner undertook the balancing act of studying the physiology of starfish, starfish by day and writing his first philosophical work on the metaphysics of the scientific idea by night. So as you see, he was steeped um, formally in both the um, 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 scientific and philosophical uh, domain um, uh, and sphere of in, in the Germany at that time. He was uh, influenced by neo-Kantians, uh, the organicist vitalist biologist, uh, particularly Driesch, he, he uh, even, um, I think that one of the books, one of the first books he wrote was dedicated to Driesch um, and phenomenolo ph phenomenologist, uh, phenomen phenomenologist, so particularly Husserl, but also Scheler and other phenomenologists that were um, kind of working at that time. Um, after he studies from 1920 to 1933, he worked as an associate professor at Cologne University. That, that was uh, apparently a newly established university. And here he basically um, uh, was very much um, engaged with uh, the thinkers of the day, so to speak. So he was in interaction with big names, such big names like Scheler, Heidegger, Hartmann, Misch. Uh, some of these names are more familiar to you. Some of these names, some of them are a bit less familiar. Um, when we have our first meeting uh, proper, so to speak, uh, which is in two weeks, I'll be um, trying to 
provide a little bit of background for, for some of these thinkers so that you know what the main points uh, were and why they were relevant uh, uh, for Plessner's um, thought. In 1933, he was dismissed because um, uh, of his Jewish background. So apparently uh, his father uh, was Jewish. Uh, and then he, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, if you have PowerPoint, we just see the whole program, not the slides. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's a that's a bummer. So I was just kind of going through the slide without. <laughs> okay, let's try this again then. That's really weird. Uh, what do you see now? Uh, the app uh, still, the whole frame. It's, it's not just the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, try playing the... This is what I will do. Look, I, 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 I've just unplugged the second monitor and let's see if this works, the second screen. Uh, is it working now? Yeah, do you see the full slide, Martin? Not yet. Not yet. I think you have to switch the Zoom to show the program of uh, slides. What do you mean by that? Stop sharing. If you stop sharing screen and then um, you share the slides screen. Yes, yeah, so well, this is precisely what I'm kind of trying to do, but apparently it's not. I'm not being particularly successful in that. Uh -huh. No, no, still the same. Okay, let's uh, try to close this and start again. This has never happened to me before, which is, of course, you know, the only way this would work. <laughs> um, it was meant to be this way. Yeah, precisely. Apparently. Um, What do you see now? Nothing nope. still? Nope. What the heck? I, I, I really do not know what to do because this was the usual procedure that I've done always. Then maybe you can just, in this program, just click the slides individually and you know what I mean. Yeah, now we see the, now we see the first. And now, nothing. Uh, it's still the app. It's showing the whole thing. Oh, so, okay. okay yeah, but, but we can see the the, the other slide. Or the yeah, yeah. Slide. Okay. So if I do it like okay. this, that's okay. Yes. Even though yeah, it's, it it's not a full screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this was basically the first slide that apparently you never saw, <laughs> where you know with his uh, birth and his uh, uh, enrollment at the university and so on and so forth. And that's the second slide. So from 1920 to 33, he was employed in, uh, at Cologne University as an associate professor. This is where he gets in touch with all these uh, prominent thinkers of his day. And then in 1933, he gets dismissed because uh, he was of Jewish descent. Uh, he goes to Turkey and from Turkey, he moves to, Net to the Netherlands. Um, he uh, is able to um, seek or get asylum there with his, Frank, with his, with his friend Frederick Buitendijk, um, an interesting physiologist who uh, was actually um, um, a close friend of Plessner's and uh, they both um, um, kind of developed the, uh, the movement of um, um, philosophical anthropology together. So Buitendijk helped, Buitendijk helped him to uh, get a job at Groningen University where he taught sociology. Clearly, those were different times, you know, uh, where you could just kind of go to a different country and get a job at a university teaching sociology. Um, although, admittedly, he did publish uh, quite a lot on sociological topics uh, already then. And then from 1940s to 1945, he was in trouble again. Uh, because the, the Netherlands uh, uh, was occupied and he had to go underground. 
and apparently uh, he was helped by his friends and his students to to um, remain in hiding till the end of the Second World War. So from 1946 to 1951, he was uh, made the chair of philosophy at Groningen University. And then in 1951, he returned to, uh, to, to Germany um, um, to take on the position of the chair of sociology. He uh, helped establish the, the sociological department. Um, he also participated in the work of uh, Frankfurt Institute uh, for Social Research, you know, the famous Frankfurt School. Um, and these were extremely active uh, years for Plessner. So he engaged with uh, um, in, in intense debates with uh, Arnold Galen, who is also a very known uh, name in, in, the, in the field of philosophical anthropology. Uh, and through these uh, debates, he attracted quite a lot of attention uh, and uh, there were a lot of, so a lot of new students became interested in his work. Uh, probably the, the most well known among these students is Habermas, uh, whom you've all at least heard of, uh, I reckon. Um, and he was you know, a, a very prolific author, so he published a lot during these years as well. Um, and um, he got retired. I, I wasn't able to find the exact date when he retired, but after his retirement, he received an offer to uh, teach philosophy at uh, Zurich University, so in Switzerland. And he did that uh, for, for some years. Um, and then in 1985, um, he, after a prolonged illness, apparently, he died in Göttingen. As I said, uh, Plessner was quite, quite a pro prolific author, so he published um, quite a lot of books, actually. Um, this is just an excerpt uh, centered around the book that we will be covering. So I was focusing mostly on, on the works that were uh, published just before this book and after uh, uh, Die Stufen. Uh, so the levels of organic life and the human. Um, two of the books he mentions uh, on several occasions in his book, in Die Stufen. So that's the first one is the Einheit der Sinne, Grundlinien einer Esthesiologie, Esthesiologie der Geistes, des Geistes from 1923. Um, the approximate translation, that's my attempt at the translation, would be the unity of, sense, of the senses or the unity of senses, elements or foundations of the philosophy of mind. This seems to be a very interesting book. Um, I have it, but I haven't read it yet. Uh, it would seem that it goes somewhat in the direction of what Merleau-Ponty was doing in Phenomenology of Perception, which is, I think, very interesting. And then the other one is Grenzen der Gemeinschaft, eine Kritik des sozialen Radikalismus from 1924, the limits of community, the critique of social radicalism. And this one is translated into, uh, into English. And uh, this one is not as important for the Stufen, but it seems, uh, it would seem that it was more um, prominent uh, at the time, because you know it addressed um, social questions, social um, so sociopolitical socio -political questions, and then we have the Stufen, so the levels which were published in 1928, and I'll say more about the levels and uh, um, you know the the, the general background uh, uh, from which they emerged and how and why they were developed and how you know, what the influences were. Um, um, then another book or the final book that I would like to mention is, this one is very often mentioned when it comes to uh, Plessner. It's called, it's called the, the Verspätete Nation. So the delayed nation on the sus susceptibility of the bourgeois mind to political seduction. And this one apparently was quite influential and also um, 
quite problematic because you know it was written in 1935 <laughs> and uh yeah so um uh plesner develops this idea of germany being this delayed nation you know uh, um, a nation that came to be uh at a later date uh as a certain other nations such as you know france and england and that this has somehow um led to the radicalism that is present in germany and that was manifesting itself in in the 30s so that's the again like a very um general and very uh, uh selective uh, presentation of Plesner's works um you can get of course uh the collected works um they were published um at Zurkamp. Uh, and since my birthday is in two days, you know, if anybody would like to uh, <laughs> give me an unexpected present, I wouldn't mind having the collected works. <laughs> um, okay, so that's basically a general introduction in who Plesner was, uh, a little bit about his work, and now a few words about the text and the general structure of the seminar. And then I'll be more than happy to pass on the word to you guys and girls. Uh, so one thing that I would like to point out immediately, as I don't know if you've already um, started reading the text, but um, the first encounter might be a bit, um, I don't know what the right word would be, but it's somewhere between perplexing and terrifying you know it's one of those things where you you're not really sure what's happening <laughs> uh and uh, it might seem very confusing the things it, uh, the thing is that the text was written in a very specific context it was uh addressing a very specific audience and um it is basically a product of its times so i think it's a very rich profound text but you kind of need to um, um need to find a way as to how to approach it and how to enter into the narrative structure of plesner's thought so as you will see um the the whole structure is quite complex um there are a lot of explicit and implicit references which might be quite confusing but uh once you get once you kind of get uh, acquainted with this overall background with the with the with the general horizon in which lesnar was um developing his ideas um then you really start appreciating how how interesting and groundbreaking in many regards this text truly um, was and is or has been um, so you know one way of looking at this text the text or basically almost all the text uh, uh, from the from from germany uh, from this period is to kind of look at them as a spider web in a certain sense or something like that where you have where, where there's just you know there's the the text itself is just a small node in a larger framework and uh, you have to have at least a general acquaintance with with this overall larger framework for you to be able to understand the allusions and who the author is uh, um, um, debating with what he's referring to and so on and so forth in a certain sense those were basically different times you know the german bildung uh um was such that there was just um you could expect from the readers to know this type of stuff to to get the to get the allusions to get the references to know what the author was uh referring to whom the author was debating and so on and so forth um and one of the things that i would that I will really try to do uh, at our next session when we have the intro into the text. So the, the, the two 
forward to the to the text is precisely to try and um, present some of the influences on Plessner's thoughts so that it might be a bit easier for all of us to then, you know, see what he's trying to do and uh, uh, who and what the main references are in the text. So um, that's, that's one of the main goals for, um, um, my, for our next session. Okay, so the, the general structure of these seminars is uh, as follows. Uh, we usually have a presentation. Uh, I think that here with Plessner, it makes sense to have presentations that are around, let's say 20 to 30 minutes, but also if somebody wants, he or she can make a, a shorter presentation, maybe even 15 minutes or whatnot. Basically, the, the general idea of the presentation is to, to um, summarize the main ideas of, of the part that we have uh, um, been reading. Uh, and then uh, this presentation is then followed by a discussion that usually lasts between 60 to 90 minutes. Now, one of the things, um, I attended a certain reading group um, on Plessner, and um, in general, it was a it was a good experience. But one of the things that I've noticed that noticed is that um, at, it happened on several occasions that people simply started so-called name dropping. So, for instance, they would you know say stuff like, yeah, yeah, but this is like a very Hegelian move on Plessner's part. And, you know, people would just then like semi accept or maybe even pretend that they know what that was, what the author was referring to. So uh, I wrote down here that it would be nice to have like grounded or founded name dropping. I don't think that it would be completely possible to avoid name dropping because there are just so many references, but I would, um, um, somehow suggest that we try to do this in a grounded manner. So for instance, if I say something like, you know, Hegel is, uh, Plessner is drawing on Hegel here, or he might be referring to this or that person, that we kind of explain what we mean by that, so that everybody is on the same page with regards to this. So that we try to presuppose as little as possible with regards to this background knowledge. You know, so that we're in the clear uh, uh, about what we're talking, uh, what we're referring to, or what we're talking about. Um, and then um, the main point, the the because when you read this text, text, you can go in so many different directions. Like a really, really um, crucial thing, I think, uh, should be uh, trying to restructure and uh, really understand Plessner's point. You know, this might sound trivial, <laughs> but you'll see when you read the text, you could just meander off in so many different directions. And we can do this, of course. I mean, we will do this. I know that we will do this. It's just like a natural part of the process. But if we really uh, could um, try to, to um, to, to really focus on, on uh, what Plessner is trying to do, to do in every chapter and reconstruct some of the main points that he's making, and then maybe take this into uh, 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 different directions. For instance, um, how does this relate to, to uh, a certain other author or a certain other topic? Uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. And actually I'm, you know, um, this is, one of the things I'm really looking forward to. So, for instance, to give a con concrete example, you know, I'm really interested in how Matt will be, for instance, uh, um, getting Plessner, coming from a certain background with certain authors that are uh, uh, more in the foreground, for instance, let's say, uh, for, for simplicity's sake, from a certain Whiteheadian background and then being confronted with Plessner. You know, this is something I'm extremely interested in to, to, to see how this will. Uh, and of course, you know, how Jan will read the text and others as well. Um, okay, and then the final thing I wanted to um, 
basically um, kind of dish out as a as a as a bit of a suggestion or a or a I don't know an open ended question is we could maybe consider if we could. Uh, use this opportunity, so use these meetings to eventually produce certain concrete results to, to do something with this. So, um, I don't know, you know, maybe we could consider the possibilities of writing something together, do some sort of a research together. So, you know, I think that working on, 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 a, on a text like this, uh, will probably bring out a lot of interesting ideas and a lot of uh, points for further discussion uh, so you know we can also have something like that in, in the background maybe trying to actually then do something with this and uh, come up with a joint project of sorts you know be it in the form of a of a paper of a of a of an essay or, or I don't know, something uh, similar to that. So I don't know, that's basically uh, what I prepared for today. Um, um, so my suggestion at this point would be because uh, I'm actually seeing some of you here for the first time today and uh, most of us don't know each other. <laughs> uh, that we have a little, um, just um, a brief, a very short round, uh, round of uh, present presentations, so to speak, self presentations, uh, self introductions. Um, and then I would be very, very happy to hear, I don't know, your thoughts about uh, the, the meetings or whether you would like to, uh, whether you would like to include, add something and so on and so forth. Oh, hey, Dan, good to see you. Hey, so, okay, I'll, I'll start and I'll just, you know, call out the names as you are, uh, as you appear on my screen. So as you know, my name is Sebastian Vörösch. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy here at the University of Ljubljana. Uh, I'm interested in many, many different things. Um, so phenomenology, um, and not an active embodied approach, uh, approaches, um, uh, philosophical anthropology. Um, lately, to be honest, you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm becoming more and more fascinated um, by by the by the German philosophical thought uh, at the end of 19th and the, the beginning of the 20th century. So I'm I'm finding you know this this period extremely extremely fascinating. So it's almost like a uh, some sort of a, a dark uh, hole you know that that captures you and draws you in. So but yeah, many different interests. Um, so the first person on the screen is Jan. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Jan Halak from Czech Republic. Uh, I work as assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy in Olomouc, and I have uh, done my PhD in Prague and in Paris, France. I have wrote a PhD on uh, Merleau-Ponty, and that's also uh, um, I'm working a lot on phenomenology, uh, and especially Merleau-Ponty. I, I had a three-year period uh, in which I explored the lesser-known text of Collège de France lectures, and I have been publishing about that for some time, uh, especially on embodiment. And more recently, I uh, I started being interested in anactivism, so uh, people like Varela or Thompson, Gallagher, uh, and that's what I'm working on now. I'm trying to combine Meloponti and this uh, more recent uh, philosophy, and I'm also partially interested in philosophical anthropology. I we have uh, we have written a paper together with Yuri Irka Kloda, who is here as well. Um, Galen and Merleau-Ponty. So um, uh, we 
yeah, uh, oh, I think this is enough about me. And thanks, Sebastian, for inviting me. I, I like the idea of, of the idea of such seminar, and I, I think I'm quite happy with the structure as it is presented. It so, uh, sounds sounds very nice. I'm looking forward. Nice. Thank you very much, uh, Yirka. It's your turn. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Jirka Klouda, Jirka, the first name. Uh, I work at, as, uh, as a research fellow at the uh, Department of Philosophy and History of Sciences at the uh, Faculty of Science, Charles University in Prague. I have obtained a PhD before 10 years. I'm interested in German uh, Lebens philosophy, philosophy of life, especially Dildheis school, Dildheis tradition, tradition of philosophy and uh, philosophical anthropology. Recently, I have uh, edited or co-edited uh, a book about Adolf Portman. Nice, nice. Thank you very much. Matt, it's your turn. Yeah, hey, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'm Matt Siegel. I'm uh, over in California, Northern California, uh, Sebastopol, if any of you are familiar. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the uh, California Institute of Integral Studies in a program called Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness. It's very interdisciplinary. Uh, most of my courses are focused on uh, process philosophy, uh, Alfred North Whitehead in particular. Um, I also teach courses on German idealism, uh, Goethe and Schelling in particular. And my research uh, is uh, of late uh, focused on sort of applying process philosophy across various um, scientific disciplines. Uh, I'm excited right now about a collaboration with a uh, an astrobiologist, Bruce Damer, and I'm trying to apply some Whiteheadian ideas to his uh, hypothesis of the origins of life. Um, we've got a long uh, book chapter with the editors now, and we'll see how it, if it survives peer review. Um, and so, you know, my interest in Plesner is, um, he's new for me. Um, I did read the two prefaces and the uh, introduction by Bernstein, was it? And so I've got some sense of where he's coming from, and I'm, I'm excited to, to dig in here. Um, I'm interested to compare uh, Plesner's thought to some other early 20th century bio biological thinkers who are not shy about um, uh, sort of expanding into philosophy, uh, even developing a kind of biophilosophy. Um, <clears throat> in some ways, that's that's you know what uh, where Whitehead's philosophy of organism stems from is you know there were some influential biologists at Harvard with Whitehead in the 1920s and 30s, uh, like Lawrence Henderson and um, uh, Wheeler, what's his first name? Um, William Wheeler, uh, who, you know, were, Wheeler studied ants, he was an entomologist, and then developed ideas about evolution and, and sociology from his study of ant colonies. Uh, and Lawrence Henderson was a physiologist and developed some ideas about the role of environments in shaping um, the evolution of organisms. And so um, I'm interested to see how Plesner's work. I didn't know he studied starfish. Uh, very interesting that that was his day job. Um, let's see how that uh, ramifies, as it were, into a, a whole biophilosophy. Um, and so we'll see. I'm, I'm, there are some indications already just from reading the preface and the, the introduction um, by the editor of this book, the translator, I think. Was it Bernstein who translated it as well, maybe? I think he was just the editor. I don't think just he the translated the book. But yeah, I he was just the editor. Yeah. Got it. So there's some possible tensions with Whitehead um, and a more sort of panpsychist, pan experientialist view. And so we'll see how that shakes out. Um, but yeah, that's me. 
Nice. Glad to be Great. here. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Laura, it's your turn. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Laura. I am originally from Germany, in Munich. Uh, but right now I'm sitting in Vancouver. Uh, I'm doing my PhD in philosophy at the University of British Columbia and my supervisor is Evan Thompson. Um, I'm mainly interested in filmology, especially Merle Ponty, but with a growing interest in Henry Bergson. I uh, just took a seminar with Evan on the philosophy of time, uh, Bergson, Whitehead, and all these thinkers, which made me very excited. Um, and yeah. I'm very happy to be part of the group and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Laura. And it's good to see you. In, I, it's not in person, but over Zoom, because so far we were just corresponding. <laughs> since what? Since, since uh, summer, right? Something like that. Yeah, it's quite a while now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, Eva, it's your turn. Hello, everyone. So my name is Eva. And I currently study forestry. I used to study biology, but then I went into forestry because I really, really like plants. But besides plants, I also like organisms in general. I would like to know the basics of life. So I really like to read theoretical biology or philosophy of biology. And some of the authors I like to read are um, Michael Marder and his plant philosophy then Jakob von Exkur, Gaston Bachelot, and David Abram. Um, besides that, in my spare time, I like to read poetry and I also write my own poetry. And I really like to go into the nature and observe the animals' behavior. I'm especially interested in um, birds and I like to determine bird species as well as plant species, like any plant I, I encounter. And um, besides all of this, I also like to draw plants. This is like my pastime. And um, I actually decided to draw some species of plant for all of you. For all of you. Um, and I will send it uh, via the group email right after my speech ends. And um, I thought this was like a good idea to introduce myself. So that's it. Yeah, Eva, well, thanks very much. And I can, uh, the, the, the poems that Eva writes are in Slovene. Uh, I'm hesitant to say, unfortunately, it's unfortunately in this particular context, but I can definitely say that they are extremely good poems. Uh, so yeah, maybe that's a nice motivation to start learning slowly. <laughs> um anyway um susanna you're up you're up next hi hi everyone um i'm susanna um now i'm back in mexico um i did my phd in philosophy of cognitive sciences and i uh i haven't learned listener yet but um I'm, i got into organicism uh through my uh my research on on habits and the cells um i i got first in cognitive sciences and then I'm like exploring these these authors and I'm very interested. I'm mainly concentrated in Merleau-Ponty and, and John Dewey during during my my PhD and of course like um uh Ezequiel Paolo, Evan Thompson, Barandiaran. Um so um I contacted um Sebastian through Twitter first <laughs> because uh, I had like a deep doubts about um, Merleau-Ponty text and he replied. So we started a like, very, very fruitful com um, conversation. And then I got uh, interested in this group. Um, I work in, in, in Okinawa, in Japan with Tom Froese and, and also like um, there, they, I think that you both, uh, Sebastian and Tom know each other well. So, so I got very good recommendation from him and like like about your works and everything and I'm very interested in in, in knowing more about these authors and, and and this research. Nice, nice. Thank and much, I yeah. like I love dogs and and I also love outdoors and music. And yeah, nice, lovely. And yeah, that was a cool exchange about the structure of behavior. One does not have a lot of opportunities to have like a really we had a really cool 
uh, ping pong about specific things in structural <laughs> behavior, you know, and uh, it, one does really not have the opportunity to do this. So it was really Especially useful for me to, yeah, to, to use this. Uh, okay, Primoz, you're up. Uh, my name is Primoz, I'm from Slovenia. Uh, I studied philosophy and comparative literature, and I, now I did my master's thesis in cognitive science, partly under Sebastian's supervision, in which I actually tried to compare uh, Plissner's uh, Stufen with uh, the, I guess, the Varelian kind of inactivism, and try to see where the two uh, frame frameworks uh, fit together. Uh, but I'm, I guess I'm mainly interested um, in Plissner because of the framework he provides for studying phenomena like uh, culture and uh, because of the connections he also has to, to do some kinds of political philosophy and trying to understand art, religion, and this is kind of the horizon uh, which uh, I'm very much interested in, but I always wanted to ground it in something uh, that's, that's not completely divorced from uh, humans as natural beings, and I think Plessner provides very, a very good ground for a more holistic understanding uh, of humans. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD student, and uh, what I'm trying, uh, I'm studying kind of like, I guess, the, broadly a metaphilosophical topic and trying to get to the, the nitty gritty of what philosophy is, what are we trying to do with philosophy in the 21st first century. And um, I do hope to be able to connect that uh, with this uh, framework Plessner and the philosophical anthropology in general provide uh, as the kind of anthropological basis uh, of philosophy. Uh, when I'm not doing philosophy, I'm, I'm, I'm a musician, I perform and uh, sometimes teach music. Um, so that's kind of my two things. And Primoz can vouch for what I've said, right? About the first encounter with Plessner being quite brutal. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not like your recommendation after I started reading. <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't planning to study uh, the levels initially. I was uh, going to work on some other work, but then Sebastian recommended uh, Plessner to me, and I thought, okay, let's do it. And I regretted it very quickly. <laughs> At the beginning, but in, but, but in the end, I became a prophet of Plessner. <laughs> so yeah, to the degree that I actually had to hold him back when he was bashing from the Plessnerian perspective, Varela and Maturana. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. so you know, this is this is the the common phenomenon with the, a common phenomenon with Plessner. So at the beginning, just this puzzlement, and then eventually, wow, there's so much there. Uh, yeah, Martin, it's your turn. Hello, uh, I'm a PhD student in the University of Ljubljana. So Sebastian is my mentor. And um, I'm doing PhD uh, in the broader topic of life extension, uh, which means like healthy longevity. Uh, and I think this uh, um, discussion will help me a lot uh, because I'm also focusing on uh, phenomenology, phenomenological side of um, a life extension and these kind of questions. So I think uh, it will be very interesting for me. Um, so yeah, if um, this is for it for me, but um, I can talk later also about um, my interest if someone is interested. Okay, yeah, especially if we see any connections or ties yeah. down the road. Okay, uh, Dan, it's your turn. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Nicholson. I'm assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at George Mason University uh, on the East Coast, close to DC in the US, although currently I'm in Vienna, in Austria. And my interest is in broadly in the history and philosophy of biology. Um, and yeah, a wide ranging interest. At the moment, I'm, I'm finishing a book on showing us what is life on the origins of the book and the reception and its influence in molecular biology. Um, and I have other projects um, on a range of different topics. I'm on the historical side, I'm looking at the development of theoretical biology in Europe, in Germany, Austria, and also in the UK. And um, I'm really looking forward to this, to reading this book. I have heard of Plessner, um, many times over the years. I think the only thing I, I read of him was the chapter 
by Marjorie Green in, that she included in this um, in this edited volume of this collection of, of, of essays, I think in 1968, called Approaches to Philosophical Biology, where she tried to introduce continental thinkers to an English speaking, um, you know, the English speaking community. I think there was a chapter on Portman and uh, Goldstein, maybe, I don't really remember, but um, but yeah, I'm excited to, to get to know you all and to hopefully find uh, interesting connections between Plessner's ideas and the ideas of the thinkers that I'm more familiar with. I've been working on the organicist tradition of the interwar period for about a decade now. So I'm really keen to see how uh, so Plessner isn't usually cited uh, in the works that I am familiar with. So I'm, I'm, I'm just keen to see, curious to see whether there's much convergence at the intellectual level and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, learn more about, um, about his thinking and how he, he reconciled or how he integrated biological thinking with, uh, with this more sort of broadly anthropological projects. So that's me. Yeah, I'm really looking also forward to these uh, parallels. I think that this would be extremely, extremely interesting, you know, hearing you pointing out certain either differences or similarities that will be very, very useful and illuminating. So thanks, Dan. Um, and finally, Chris also joined us. I'm really happy about that. So hey, Chris, and maybe you can share a few words about yourself. Sure. I'm, I'm Christopher Donahue. I'm the historian of the National Human Genome Research Institute, which is one of the uh, either 17 or 27. I think it's 17 institutes and centers of the, the National Institutes of Health, which is a, a, bio, a biology and medicine uh, research funding agency in the United States. And I'm um, right outside Washington, D.C., so actually somewhat close to Dan in terms of his, his normal location, not his, not his present location. Um, so my, my uh, expertise is in the contemporary uh, medicine and the life sciences, um, and also uh, specifically um, in terms of history of genetics, history of population genetics in particular. I'm also very interested in bioethical issues. Um, I will also say at the same time that I'm a very traditionally trained historian of, of intellectual history and of uh, the history of philosophy. Um, and I am uh, very quite interested in uh, figures like Plessner or Galen or Shaler because of, I think, their comically misunderstood influence in 20th century uh, thought most generally. Um, and I was, I am particularly interested in, uh, in particular, how Plessner's ideas uh, kind of have a, have a very wide net in post-war uh, German and continental thought to a degree that I don't think is, is uh, really recognized. And you can see, for example, Plessner's influence on people like Wolfhard Pannenberg. Um, and I think also generally I'm interested in kind of uh, the contours of philosophical anthropology, what it is um, and where does it begin, where does it end, and how can it help us really uh, this uh, really kind of address some cont issues in, in contemporary bioethics or contemporary history and philosophy of the life sciences. I don't know if Seb, that was okay. <laughs> that was marvelous. I would just like to add here that uh, Chris is probably one of the most eclectic thinkers I've ever come across. I mean, he's the, he, he's the type of guy who knows everything about everything and about everyone. And I think Dan can, can, can vouch for this. I mean, uh, you know, uh, the, more obscure, the more obscure the thinker, <laughs> the more Chris seems to know about the person. <laughs> Well, if I'm interested in you, you're really in trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obscure, so that's a, that's a good sign already. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, thank you very much for these introductions. Um, 
I would, yeah, one, one, one thing that we also have to kind of go through is I've, I've prepared a, a provisional plan for our meetings and I would like to share this with you. Um, I think it's, um, let me just uh, see where I have it. I think it's um, a very doable plan, so to speak, um, as you'll see. Um, okay, can you see this? Yeah, okay, good. So uh, our next meeting would be basically, but this is an exception, the already next week because it's um, uh, this this meeting doesn't count in a certain in a certain way. So we start with our meetings properly next week, and then we have uh, another meeting after that in two weeks, and another one in two weeks, and then okay. So th the reason. Let me explain the, the, the reasoning behind this. Uh, okay, uh, Dan, are you, still, are you still there or no, he already went. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the main point is that once we really get into the, um, into the core of Plessner's ideas, which is from chapter three onwards, uh, I, I thought that it might be a good idea to always split the chapter in two and have it covered in two uh, subsequent weeks. And then we have two weeks off. So we always have two meetings at the beginning of the uh, month, and then we have two weeks off, and then we have another chapter, two weeks, you know. Uh, prior to getting to the third chapter, um, the the, the structure would be somewhat different. So here again, we would have one meeting next week and then another one in two weeks and then another one in two weeks. And then we start with the, with a, with a scheme that I proposed um, that I mentioned uh, or outlined earlier. I don't know, I, I, I was thinking about this and I think that this is a, um, a pretty doable plan. Uh, I would also encourage you to um, just, you know, volunteer to, to present a certain chapter. Um, as you can see, it's not that um, big of a load in the sense of pages that need to be presented. Um, so, um, and also it doesn't have to be like an expert presentation or whatnot. The, the, the general idea is simply to go over the main points uh, and then we will cover uh, uh, everything else in, in the discussion. So um, I volunteered to present the first two uh, chunks of the book. So the, the two prefaces, so as to try to uh, embed the text into a somewhat broader uh, framework so that it is somewhat easier for us to actually start start uh, 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 grappling with uh, Plesner's ideas. And then the first chapter, the aim and the scope of the study, and then Primoz volunteered to um, take over the second chapter. Uh, we've agreed that we, are, we, we were going to um, go through these chapters uh, at a slightly quicker pace than uh, uh, the rest of the book. Then chapter three, if nobody volunteers, I will you know, present the chapter three, although I'd much prefer if, again, somebody else would, uh, would be willing to uh, uh, take over uh, these, th this chapter. And then uh, there's, um, there are all these empty slots here. <laughs> Uh, just waiting uh, to be filled by your names. <laughs> so um, this is not something that you have to decide now or what have you. It it will be added to the emails, uh, and you can you know see if you, you could you could do something or you could uh, um, present a certain a given chapter if that would be uh, okay with you. So that's the that's the general structure. Any thoughts on this? Any comments? Uh, 
I think the, 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 the tempo shouldn't be too intense. Uh, uh, I think it's very doable. Um, we took the easy parts. <laughs> I didn't take the easy parts. I, I just suggested uh, I would much rather have, if I'm honest, uh, chapter four and or and or chapter uh, sorry chapter uh, six and or chapter seven. I'd much prefer to have these, if I'm honest. Uh, I took these because I um, I'm pretty sure that nobody would want to volunteer for the first presentations. <laughs> And uh, because I've already read the book twice, yeah, Chris. I, I was gonna say because I mean, in a, in a way, yeah, we've already done a little a lot of this, so I, I can. Uh, no, I don't care about being the. the you know, like, if you want me to to present on chapter three, I think I've already presented on chapter three <laughs> okay let's do in another, it then. in the several other contexts so that's that's fine marvelous um, okay so we have we already have first first three chapters covered that's marvelous yeah. mm -hmm. and then after that we can just you know we can see if other people like would want to do that do it and if not then uh chris maybe <laughs> you would be uh you might feel inspired to take, take something else on board as well I mean, yeah, that's that's no problem. I mean, I I think uh, that that's frankly fine fine with me. Yeah, but um, we'll see. So how how we'll see we'll see how it goes. Uh, okay, I don't good. want to. I don't want to preclude anybody else getting okay, uh, so their sense just, in. Also, no. just a general question: Do you think that this structure uh, is this okay with you? Uh, do you think it's feasible? It's doable. <laughs> Would that work for you in general? Works for me. Okay, good. Nice. Happy to hear that. Okay, so I don't know. Any other uh, comments, questions, suggestions, what have you uh, about the book or about anything? No? I was Martin, you excited wanted... to see Plessner yeah. begin uh, with that excerpt from Alexander von Humboldt, yeah. uh, a letter yeah. to Schelling. Um, <laughs> that, that definitely uh, woke me up. Uh, Good start to the book. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in general, I think that uh, uh, the whole first chapter is, yeah, it, it's, it's, very, um, it's a very inspiring read. Like, you know, mm. some of the things, some of the points that he makes there are just... It's, just it's the middle finished. chapters that go crazy. <laughs> yeah, and also the chapters that you'll be presenting. The, the yeah. Cartesian one, he, you know, sometimes he just kind of gets into these loops. Uh, well, well, you'll see. <laughs> you'll see what I have in mind here. Um, so, okay. Uh, yeah, I have one question. Okay. Will you make a note uh, or, uh, or not? What do you mean? When we present, will someone make notes or not? Or how, what is the idea? Uh, you mean write the thing down or, uh, I mean, when I will be presenting, I'll always have a PowerPoint. So as a okay. background and uh, we will be recording this so it will be accessible also you know for further reference i'm i don't think that we will be producing uh written material uh or okay. uh anything of the sorts chris yeah i i'm i'm not committing myself to anything by saying this so i just want to make that clear <laughs> but i i i think it's sometimes helpful to have a um in my case Mm -hmm. to have something that is pre-circulated in addition to some PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. Because I make terrible PowerPoint slides, but I do have nice working papers. And you've, you've told me how terrible my slides are in the past. I, I, did. So. <laughs> I, I just, I just uh, provided some suggestions how to yeah, further improve them. Yeah, which are really them. great, but I never, I, I can only follow them so much. <laughs> okay. Locked but, in, okay, in but, my own uh, being here. Um, so Chris, I, I will probably uh, circulate something beforehand because if I, otherwise I have no idea what I'm really going to say. Okay, um, good. 
that, that, that's that's perfectly fine and also um what i normally do when we have when we're discussing a, a given book i usually um um i'm usually i usually uh um make this document of sorts where i try to collect all the main ideas uh from each uh chapter so I i'll also be doing this uh on the fly so to speak so uh towards the end of our meetings i i can share that with you if that would be of interest uh i can't promise that i'll be able to uh keep up with with the tempo uh so uh i might be able i, I might have to produce some of the things uh after the presentations and after the discussions or meetings but uh, yeah yeah maybe sebastian if you will be doing notes i was just curious um to make a test of obsidian you know obsidian uh, what What's obsidian again? Is it the, the note taking? The note taking yeah. thing? So pretty much you know it, yeah. <laughs> yes. The note taking. My life is based on it. <laughs> I will contact you, uh, pretty much. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. Let, let's let's give obsidian a go then. I guess. It, it's it's an interesting thing because you have all these different thinkers, and then you start to link the various ideas uh, okay. together. And then you see like a, a web starting to emerge uh, of various connections between texts and the ideas and the books. And so, yeah, it's very fascinating. So, am I the only one? But you already told me about Obsidian, right, Martin? I just yes. forgot. Yeah. So, okay. Does everybody else know what Obsidian is? It's a note-taking <laughs> app now? where you, you where you have the ability to link to other uh, our, uh, other texts in your collection very easily. And then, then it shows you like a map uh, and uh, always shows you the backlinks from one article to another. And so, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> very uh, could you Could you write the name like in the chat? I can sure. write it down. Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, Matt, you know, you know it, right? Um, okay. I just looked it up, so I'll, I'll investigate. It looks neat. Oh, okay. Part of the yeah. revolution. I, 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 I was certain that you, you knew it somehow because you always seem to be on top of these technical <laughs> things. I would be using a typewriter if I could. I think this is a, <laughs> I think this yeah, is a very, that, this is a a, very dangerous uh, uh, tool in my hands. That, <laughs> that's a, that's uh, the right uh, Niklas Luhmann had these uh, Zettelka Zettelkasten uh, in index cards, which he linked <laughs> manually with uh, like mm. IDs. And <laughs> so that, that's the uh, or origin of this obsidian idea. Yeah. There's a very interesting history, and of course, this is probably why uh, of the one one fact one card idea. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it goes back to Fraser, and uh, who is an Oxford anthropologist, um, and you can uh, it was a, a typical anthropological method uh, device in anthropology for for many many years, and uh, Alan McFarlane, who is a well known anthropologist and historian of of capitalism. Uh, and also of Japan and China and comparative frameworks has something close to 200,000 cards that he has collected over the course of his, um, this is before he had to put everything into a computer. So there's a very rich tradition of one fact, one card. Actually, Jack London, who is the American uh, uh, novelist of kind of nature, American nature as he saw it, um, uh, and manliness and all sorts of things uh, had also a very specific one fact one card system. So very interesting where Luman might may have gotten this idea. Uh, uh, other people use slips of paper. Um, Gellner, I think, used slips of paper. So anyway, sorry. What did I tell you, right? <laughs> uh, that was a, a, you know, a very good demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> of what I had in mind before about Chris knowing everything about everything. Um, yeah. So, right. yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for uh, joining this first session. Uh, I'm looking forward to going through this book with you. Um, I'm particularly looking forward to the discussion. Um, and I'll be seeing you in one week, right? Yeah. Okay. Have a good one.
See you in seven Bye. days. Bye. Bye.